All right, you ready? Lord, I choose to obey your word, for as I dwell and walk in your presence, I shall not lack. Poverty be far from me and my household in Jesus' name. In your blessings, Lord, I will rise above all that hell has to offer and accept heaven's best here on earth. Everything I set my hands to will prosper because I make you my dwelling place. You are my refuge and my fortress. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. I accept it by faith, fully expecting your blessings in every area of my life. For wherever your presence is, there is no lack. Therefore, Lord, as we receive today's offering, we are believing you for an abundant harvest, health, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, scholarships and grants, inventions with royalties, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increased, bargains and child support. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of our financial needs that we may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, last week, we, I preached about uh, redeeming the time. You remember that? And it was, the, it was our last four-letter word Sunday. So we're not going back there this year. We're going to move on. And that word time in, in Ephesians chapter 5, it means opportunity. When you look it up in the Greek, it meant opportunity. We are, to re, we are to redeem the opportunities that we have. But a lot of times we don't recognize our opportunities, so, you know, they just slip right on by us. And uh, I know that someday we're going to stand before God. And as Christians, we're going to be judged for how we lived our lives. Now, if you're here today and you're lost, I want to encourage you that you need to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It will be the single greatest decision that you'll ever make in your life, to know in your heart that your name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, to be able to experience the Holy Spirit in dwellings presence, to know that you have a guide, a comfort, a comforter, a helper, a helpmate, whatever it is that you need when Jesus lives inside of you, you have access to the very throne of God, the God who's able to do absolutely anything that needs to be done for anybody at any time. And uh, we, we've talked about it in the past. We'll talk about it again today. There's absolutely nothing's too hard for God. The problem is that we fail to believe. Jesus said, whatever you can ask in faith believing, you shall receive. Now, the, So that always puts the ball in our, back in our court. And uh, we are a word of faith family because it was the faith message in the beginning that changed my life. I'd been saved for uh, several years. I got saved when I was a boy. <laughs> I walked over this morning in the dark and I I was singing, it was on a Sunday. <laughs> Anybody ever, probably you ain't, none of you old enough to know that song, except maybe a brother, a house, sister, Alicia back there. It was on a Sunday when I got saved. And then I, I got singing it, and it was on a Sunday when I rededicated my life. It was on a Sunday when I accepted a call to preach, you know. So a lot of good things happen on Sundays, and I believe in my heart that some good things can happen today on this day. And if you've got a problem, a need, if you're not born again, then this, this needs to be your day. And we got people who would love to uh, bow with you and pray with you. It's always as simple as ABC, admit, believe, and confess. Jesus is the Son of God, knowing in your heart that you're lost and that Jesus died on the cross for you. I'm telling you, just believe and, and accept him today. But I want you to know something else. It doesn't matter. You know, a lot of times we get saved when you're young. I did, and then I went about my merry way. And like a lot of you, there are things in my past that we're not going to talk about, okay? Because they're under the blood. He doesn't remember it, neither am I. So I'm not going to remind you of something that you might look at me and think, Brother Dale used to act like that or talk like that or be like that. No, you guys know me as being almost perfect, so let's keep it that way. Amen? <laughs> you know, this handsome, good-looking guy with no hair, uh, he never did anything too seriously wrong, but yet I did things I don't, I'm not proud of and I know that you have too, and I love the fact that, you know what, that can all be behind us. Uh, the slate can be wiped clean. I don't care where you've been, what you've done. Listen, when you accept Jesus Christ, when you repent for the error that's in your life, the wrong things, listen, God, he doesn't bring that up no more. He's done with it. He has the ability to do that. You may not forget it completely, but you can forgive yourself. That's a message that we preach often here because 
A lot of times we forgive others, but you fail to forgive yourself. So if you, if you drug anything with you from last year, now's a good time to unload that. If you got a ball and chain about anything that was in your life, now's a good day. Today's a good day to just be free from that, knowing that, hey, I'm in the first Sunday of the new year. God's got good things in store for me. And I can honestly say and believe in my heart that this is going to be the best year of my life. Well, I was wondering, all right? I mean, it's a decision that we make. It's choices that we have. We can make it the best year. Whatever man sows, he reaps. So if I'm going to sow good things in my life this year, I'm going to reap good things. There's absolutely no reason but one for you not to have the best year of your life, and you are that reason. If you don't choose to have the best life, you won't have it. If you don't choose to make the right decisions, you won't make the right ones. If you don't choose to follow God, then you won't follow God. If you don't choose to uh, walk out of your past, then your past will just hang out and you'll wear it like a coat and it will remind you every time that you put it on that you've got something going on that doesn't need to be there. Listen, these choices are ours. And so my choice is to put the past behind me. That's why I had to uh, confess before I could preach today because I recognize I made a mistake that I don't want to make again in this year. I don't want to make that same mistake ever again. So I'm choosing to trust God, and you've got to do the same thing. Now what I do know today is that, listen, for this to be the best year of our life, we're going to have to overcome some obstacles. There's not a person in this room who doesn't have some stuff that's going on. We talk about it every week. I, I could stand up here and I, I could write down on a piece of paper, starting with my front pew, and I could put everybody's names down there and everybody in this building today, I could put a prayer request out by your side because some of you need your husband saved. Some of you need a new spouse. Some of you need reconciliation with children. Some of you need healing in your body. Some of you need uh, different things. Amen? Everybody here does. We've all got things in our life that we're going to have to overcome. And let me tell you, I love the scripture that's over in 1 John chapter 5 where the Bible says that we overcome by faith. It's our faith that overcometh the world. Kelly's saying about being an overcomer a while ago. Listen, you know who we can be? Overcomers. There are some of you in this room just like me, and I, I could have you stand up today. There's things, you know this, you've already overcome. I'm not that person anymore. If you were given a testimony today, you would say, I'm not that person anymore. You'd say, I've got to pass. Kelly sang that song. Yeah, thanks to the mercy and the grace of God, we've overcome some things. We probably still got some things, though, that we're going to have to overcome. And a lot of times, the obstacles that are in our life are not really the ones that we think that they are. In 1 Peter chapter 4, the Bible says, Think it not strange, the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Truth is, the devil's going to wage a deeper, more powerful spiritual warfare against you this year than he ever has because he recognizes how close his time is. He understands what's going on in the world and in the future of the world better than all of us. And so, yeah, he's going to try us every chance he gets. We're going to have temptation. We're going to have tests. Uh, people are going to offend us. They're going to try their best. Listen, all of you, you're going to have family members. Jesus said in the last days that sometimes our enemies would be they of our own household. Sometimes it's not the stranger out there that gives you the problem. Sometimes it's the people that are close to you. It'll be the guys at work that'll try to give you a hard time. It'll be somebody in your family who's just hard-headed and, and uh, halfway rotten, you know, that needs Jesus. Because everybody's got people in their family that needs Jesus. I do and you do. And you know what's sad? And I, we were confronted with this just a few days ago. Listen, we're, we're faced with new sets of trials. The first, when I first I started to preach, I thought I'd seen it all. One of the most stupidest statements that I ever made as a 33-year-old young man was that, well, I've seen it all. Listen, I hadn't seen nothing, amen, compared to what I have seen in the last five to 10 years, and I can't even imagine, and neither can you, what we're going to witness in the next five to 10 years, the way our world is going the way that people are just compromising with all the things of the world, 
Listen, they don't like the message I preach, and a lot of times I don't preach as hard as what I should because I understand that people don't like a, a hard message and they, it gets under their skin and sometimes people just back off from God because they don't want to change. They don't want to make right choices. But Jesus literally said, if the love of the world is in us, then the love of God is not. If we love the things of the world more than we love God, we've got a real problem. And what I see in our society is that people love the things of the world. And people, they'll say, well, that, that's not so bad, is it? Well, it's not about whether it's so bad or not, but did it come from God? Is it something that God approves of? Is it something that God says, you can do this, you're okay with this? You have faith to believe that it is, you're all right. But most people don't have faith to believe. They just accept what's going on. And let me tell you, the devil's throwing obstacles at people all the time that are hindering them from being filled with the Spirit, feeling, uh, they are so consumed with themselves and with the things of the world and their life and their lifestyle that they can't get real with God and God can't get real with them. And so God's Word can't work for them because they're not working the Word. And we preach that here all the time because if the Word's not working for you, you're not going to be successful in anything that's real in life. And when we stand before the Father, I'm not going to answer for not having told you the truth. And when I get there, and I'm, and I'm accountable for what I say to every one of you, uh, listen, I want God to be able to say, you did your best, son. I do. And so I love you, and because of that, I'm going to tell you that there are a lot of things that are going on in our world that God doesn't like. There are things that people are doing, places that people are going, lifestyles that people have that God's not into. And God will never be into it because he wasn't into it in Genesis and he wasn't into it in the other 65 books and he is the Lord who does not change and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever and in Genesis chapter 1, God said to him, let us make man in our own image. Listen, he's been here from the beginning and he hasn't changed. And when he says there's things he doesn't like, then he doesn't like them. And if he doesn't like them, he's not tolerating them. It's like the woman who came and they were going to stone her to death because she was caught in adultery. And he said, listen, he said, you with the first sin, throw the first, without sin, throw the first stone. They all walked away because they were all guilty as what she was. And he, he didn't condone her sin and he didn't condemn her, but he gave her direction. And if God would give us direction today, get this one, take this one home with you, live by this one, Jesus looked at her and said, Daughter, go and sin no more. What would God tell us today? Go and sin no more. And so what I want to share with you today, I'm going to share the first obstacle that we have in life to overcome this year. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the writer of Hebrews said, Seeing that we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, look at it. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and then we can run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, we can kid ourselves and try to kid everybody else, but listen, I see people that are weighted down. They've got so much on their plate, they can't serve God, they can't be where God wants them, they can't do what God wants done, they ain't got time to witness, they ain't got time to share a testimony, they ain't got time to practice singing, they ain't got time to go to church, they ain't got time to pray, they ain't got time to study their Bible. They are weighted down with things that didn't come from God, so where did they come from? When I don't have time for God, it's because I've allowed the world to impact my life to put such weights on me that I can't unload them free and free myself so that I can serve Him the way God wants. Man, you guys got quiet. That's an amen or an oh me, but it's one or the other. Listen, I, I just talked about the weight. I haven't even talked about the sin yet. But you know what? Uh, if the Bible calls it sin, then it's still sin. And sin, when it, when it manifests, what does the Bible say? It brings forth death. That's not life, that's death. Now, I know that we're all sinners. Amen? Amen. We've all come short of the glory of God. We've all made mistakes. 
But you know what Paul said? God forbid that we would go and sin again and try to re-crucify Christ who's already forgiven us for that. And when he forgave us from the sin that was in our life, he had the intent that we wouldn't do that no more. And we do not have to sin. Where have you read it in here that you have to sin? That you have to do things wrong even when you know that it's wrong. It's not in here that you have to. God made us all free will, what we call a moral agents. We make our own choices. When we sin, we chose to. That ain't no Flip Wilson thing here where the devil made us do it. All the devil can do is come against you, tempt you, try you, test you, put it out there in front of you. It's an obstacle that you have a choice to do something with. Waits and sin. Have you asked yourself, God, how come I'm not closer to you now than I've ever been? How come I don't love you more than what I ever have? How come I don't please you better than what I ever did? Why is life such a struggle for me, Lord? You know why it is? Because we separate ourselves from God. How do we separate ourselves from God? We allow an obstacle there standing in our path. Instead of us removing the obstacle... Instead of us getting help and pushing it aside, instead of us getting on our face before God and say, God, I need some help here, you know what we do? We'll take a door that's cracked and we'll open it wider. If we got by with sin in our life a little bit, we'll think, well, if I can get by with this a little bit and nobody knows it and I, I, I haven't felt no pressure and God hadn't hit me in the face, preacher hadn't touched on it, let me give you some advice. Don't open a door that's not open. Don't give the devil even a crack because if you do, he'll, he'll just take it even worse. And definitely don't sow bad seed because if you do, you're going to have a bad harvest. If you don't know that message, hang around a little bit. We'll preach it another day because everything comes out of our mouth is a seed, whether it's good or bad. And when I, when I say things that are contrary to what the Word of God says and when I make excuses Apart from the Word of God, if I justify the weight or the sin that's in my life, listen, all I'm doing is opening the door for the devil to come in and strengthen my resolve not to please God. Because the truth is, we're either resolved to please God, and we've made that commitment, and we are resolved. We're, we're saying, like I said, I'm going to make 2024 my best year yet. Amen? I'm going to make it my best year yet. That's my resolution for the year in every aspect of my life. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to do what God says. Regardless of how I feel, regardless of what other people say, regardless of how much trouble that I get in, listen, God's bigger than all of that. Amen? And He's the only one who's able to free me from the weight when, when the Peter said, cast all your cares on the Lord, listen, he was talking about the weight. He was talking about the things, I don't need this in my life. There are those of us in this room, we've got, you've got people in your life you don't need. You've got things in your life that you don't need. You've got ideas in your life that you don't need. You've got plans in your future that you don't need. They become weights. Ways that separate you from what God's will is for your life. Don't allow that first obstacle to be one that puts you on the out when it comes with God. Amen? There's another obstacle that you need to recognize. It's one that we all fight every single day of our life. And if you're not fighting it and pushing it, and pushing it back, then it's, it's got you. That's your feelings your emotions, our traditions, and our own wisdom. We're not supposed to be moved by our feelings. We're supposed to walk by faith. Our emotions should be a result of our faith and not of our fear. Our traditions, listen, Jesus warned the church about the traditions of men. And you know what I deal with, Susan deals with, in ministry you deal with? The first thing that people want to say is we've always done it this way. This is who I've always been. This is how I've always acted. This is how it's always touched me. This is how. This is how. They're all looking backwards at something that doesn't necessarily apply to today, to their life, and it probably should have never applied to it. Listen, the traditions of men will get you in serious trouble because they're of men and not of God. And the traditions move our feelings. The devil wants you to be moved by your feelings. He wants you to be controlled by your emotions. You ask somebody, go do something, and they'll say, oh, I don't feel like it. 
Just tell your 13-year-old, take the trash out. What do you get? Uh, you get a look? Yeah, and if you get a word, it'd be like, I'll do it later, all right? We got a four-year-old that'll do just about absolutely anything that you ask if she's capable, but when she gets 13, she'll be more like her sister. Amen? You know what we got in the body of Christ? A whole bunch of 13-year-olds who don't feel like doing something, so they don't do it. They're not moved emotionally by something, and so, you know, it's like, well, it's not any good. You know, there's two words that I hate with a passion, and my grandson's pretty good at saying them sometimes. And you know what they are? I'm bored. I'm bored. When my little one come out with that, I wanted to slap her. I'm like, no, you're not bored. You have no reason to be bored. You have bored you. Listen, you know what's wrong with the church? They're bored. Boredom set in in the body of Christ several years ago. And because people came in on Sundays and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, and they not applied themselves to righteousness, and they weren't excited about serving God, and they weren't doing anything to enhance any service that they ever set in, they came in and they were bored with the singing, and they were bored with the playing, and they were bored with the preacher, and they were bored with whatever, and you know, how many teenagers do we have in here that quit church because of boredom? You're not teenagers now. You're 50 years old. When did you quit church, Michael? How come you quit? Because your grandpa told you you didn't have to go. If you'd loved church, would, what would you have told Charlie? He would have said, you know what, grandpa, I'm going to go anyway. I like church. I like going to Sunday school. I like being taught. I like the singing. I like. I sat in a board meeting one time and they had the nerve to tell me, okay, that oh, we're not in competition with the world for our kids. That's what they told me. And you know what I said? The minute we quit competing, we lost. They say, how come we're losing our kids? Because they're bored. Because service was dead. Because nobody was applying themselves to the church. And you know what? They were all bored. That's why all those churches have closed their doors. Boredom was the excuse. Well, if you're bored, how come you're bored? How come? Are we waiting around for somebody to cause us to be excited? Are we waiting for something to stir us when we've got the spirit that indwells our heart? And we've got the Word of God that, let me tell you, if you can't get excited about the Word of God, you need to get back on your face before God. If you can't get excited about what the promises of God are, and it's boring to read the Bible, listen, you've got a problem. It's a problem that can't be fixed unless you decide to fix it. The Bible does not have to be boring. Church should not be boring. Listen, I'm going to entertain you if I've got to uh, tell jokes or if I've got to confess my faults or if I've got to get loud and spit all the way down to Leanne, whatever that it takes. Every now and then I wipe just to make sure nothing's going down my cheek, you know. When you're laughing at me, I just never know for sure. Listen, we've got to learn how to trust in God. What does Solomon say? Lean not to your own understanding, but acknowledge Him in all your ways and He will make our path straight. He won't lead you down a boring path. Let me tell you, the first thing they're going to find is another obstacle. An obstacle ought to be an opportunity for you and I to say, hey, look, God, what the devil's trying to do. God, how are we going to defeat this one? God, what are we going to do about this one? God, how can I pray over this one? God, who can I get to help me remove this obstacle? We shouldn't look at our obstacles and think, oh, no, now what are we going to do? Well, we just well stay at home. I don't feel good today. Just well stay at home. They're, my favorite show is coming on TV. Just well stay at home. No, you know what we'll do? We'll let the tiniest of obstacles stop us in our tracks. The smallest of things that the world throws because somewhere down deep inside, you lack the true desire to follow God and be everything that God wants you to be. Now, if that hurts, it hurts. And I love you, and I'm sorry, but we've got to get closer to God in these last days. And we've got to get to that place where the devil can't throw a rock in my path. It's going to have to be a boulder. 
and I'm not going to be able to remove it with a spoon. I'm going to have to have some bulldozer faith, and I'm going to have to get myself in a gear that will move that because I'm not going to be moved from side to side without God. I'm going on with Jesus. Emotions, you bet you're going to have them. Feelings, you, you need to have feelings. But they need to come as a result of you trusting God. I'm telling you, faith has a shout. It does. Faith will make you raise your hands, feeling good about you. Uh, God will make you do a lot of strange things. I, that's a problem with us. We're not strange enough, I guess. You know what? I don't care what we face this year, the obstacles that we have. God has a better way and more resources than what I have. So if it's something that I, you know, that's, that's causing me trouble, I just need to turn it over to God. I need to say, God, I need a little help here because I want to be what you want me to be. And I want to go where you want me to go. And I want to do what you want me to do. And if I'm praying over a dying woman, I want to pray the right prayer. And if I'm laying hands on somebody sick, I want to say the right words. And I want to do it in faith, and I want to remind the devil that God's able to do whatever is necessary or required for this event to take place in a way that pleases God. Amen? You know what else we got to do? Paul made it very plain. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, uh, 4 through 6. Listen, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Preached on this Wednesday night. Mighty through God did pulling down of strongholds. Look at verse 5. Look at that third word, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You know what the third obstacle is? Imagination. Why is it that we let our imaginations go crazy? We imagine stuff that ain't no more real than anything. And yet the very things that God's word promises us that we should be imagining and we should have that in our thought process and we should be meditating on it, all right, that's not what we're imagining. You know, uh, people are driving down the road and you hear a funny noise and you think, uh-oh, my car's going to turn. You hear something don't sound right, boy, I hope my motor ain't going bad. You hear a squeak. I guess our brakes are wore out. You hear something in the kitchen. You're in the other room. I hope that's not a refrigerator. Our mind goes crazy. The devil makes sure that it does. And we imagine all kinds of things. Well, it'll probably cost me 500 bucks to get my brakes fixed. Where in the world are we going to get the money? What are we going to do? I guess we'll just have to quit driving. We can imagine all kinds of And you can look at me funny. I know how you are. I've heard Jens talk my whole life, most of you. We do that. How many times you go to your closet and you didn't have a thing to wear? And yet you didn't have an empty hanger anywhere. I tell you, our imaginations, they need to be cast down. Okay? We don't need to be fantasizing about worldly things. Our dreams shouldn't be about the next vacation that I'm going to have. Listen, God wants you to have vacation. God will send you on one. If all I can do is plan and prepare and save money for it, then am I planning on serving God? Am I preparing to win souls? Am I? See, we need to stop and think about the life that we're living, the thoughts that are in our head. Listen, I, I teach about meditating on the Word of God. God told Joshua that's when you find good success, when you meditate on the Word of God day and night. Get some word in your head. Memorize some scripture. Have a renewed mind. Romans 12, verse 1. Don't be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind. A renewed mind casts down imaginations in every vain thing that lifts itself up against God. If you're going to imagine something, imagine yourself standing in a pulpit and preaching. Imagine yourself writing a book, writing a song, singing a special, teaching a class, knocking on somebody's doors. There are so many good things that we can think about where our mind can take us, where we can think about how can I be a blessing? How can I help my neighbor? What do I need to do here? You guys have heard it said many times. Where's the devil's playground anyway? Right there. In your mind, 
That's where the devil has access to your life. That's how he infiltrates your body and your spirit is through your mind. And when your mind is not focused on God and on God's word and on God's way, trying to prove his will, listen, he, he gains access through your body. You know, in the last two or three weeks, how many of you have had some flu, some flu bug, some snotty nose? You can go ahead and raise your hand. Probably about three-fourths of the people in here has fought it off. Or you had it and you, yeah. And you know what happened? Some of you imagine yourself being sick. Some of you imagine yourself going to a doctor. Sometimes we imagine ourselves taking medicine. All those things are good when necessary. But did I imagine myself healed? Do I imagine myself whole? Do I imagine myself not going to a doctor? I, I looked the other day at my insurance thing. And I'll, I'll, uh, let me be honest, okay? You got to love me. You may not like me, but you got to love me. I, I thank God for Medicare Advantage plan. A lot of people hate it. People, uh, some say, well, I wouldn't have that for nothing. And I'm like, hey, let me tell you what they did for me. My medical bills last year was 98600 and some odd dollars. Yeah, and I preach healing. I believe it's by stripes I'm healed. You know how much my payout was out of my pocket last year? Out of 98600 and some odd dollars? $1,110 is what I paid out. Oh, God, I'm thanking God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that even though I didn't trust you enough for my healing, thank you, Lord, that I didn't prepare myself to be whole the way that I should have. Thank you, Lord, that even though I allowed my body to contact and have cancer in my prostrate, that, Lord, you saw me through that. I stand today cancer-free. You paid my bills. You took over for me. You brought me home the same day. You supplied my need when I was not up to supplying my own need. Yeah, I, I give God praise. But was that God's plan for my life? No. But was God planning for my life ahead of time? Did I ever imagine myself dead? No, I'll, I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, I make mistakes, but I never imagined myself laying in the hospital for a week. I did not imagine myself taking treatments. I did not imagine myself losing the rest of my hair. Amen. I imagine myself healed, coming home, cancer-free, standing in pulpit preaching the Word of God. Is 2024 going to be my best year yet? You better believe it. Amen? And not just me, but mine as well. Because thus go at the head of the house, the rest follow. You're in here today and you're the head of your house. You need to make a firm commitment. I'm not going to let any ob obstacles stand in front of me. My blessing, my favor, my family, my kids, my grandkids, our church, we're not going to do it. If I've got to cast down every imagination and anything that lifts itself up to, against the will of God, I'll cast it down in Jesus' name. That's an amen on my part. You know what follows that one? The other obstacle that you've got to get? And that's old, wrong mindsets. And we've all got some. We've got some mindsets. This is the way it ought to be. Sometimes it's about what we, uh, time we start church. Sometimes about how we dress. Sometimes it's about how we treat people. Sometimes it's about songs that we sing. Sometimes it's about uh, scripture that I've heard. And, I, you know, in 32 years or plus, I've had a lot of people say, well, I thought the Bible said this. What, doesn't the Bible mean this? I don't believe you, Brother Dale. I don't think it, God meant it that way. Yeah, you know what? We've all got some wrong mindsets. We've got some that keep us hindered when it comes to being fully uh, pledged to God about mindsets. Listen, uh, you know, this church here ain't the only one going to heaven. It's easy to get a mindset about the neighbor's church. Well, you know, I don't think they're going to make it down there. I don't, I don't think they believe God the right way. Listen, that's between them and God. We pray for them. If you think they're in danger, pray for them. If you don't like what they believe and it doesn't sit well with you and you think you can prove them wrong, don't go down there and try and prove them wrong. Pray and say, God, you need to speak to someone's heart that they'll listen to. We can get mindsets about the person who lives on the street behind us and think, you know, we just can't have anything to do with them. We can have wrong mindsets about so many different things if we're not cautious. Whether we're at work, at home, at school, uh, involved in someone's life? Listen, wrong mindsets. How many times have, have we looked at somebody and we thought, man, I don't know if God could save them or not? How many times you thought that about yourself anyway? 
There's some of you in the room thought that about yourself. Listen, what can God do? He can do anything. All things are possible with God. That was a wrong mindset. There's people, you know, they have poverty mentality, and people think, well, they're never going to be any better off than they are right now. There's people that are sick. They're never going to get well. They're going to die from that. That's part of my wrong mindset from the other day. All right? We can believe somebody dead when they're still breathing because it's a wrong mindset. I'm telling you, we're not dead until there's no breath left. Wrong mindset. Yeah. <laughs> Jeremiah 32, 27. That's the one we love. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? You got a Bible, you ought to circle that one in there. Maybe you ought to take one of the white pages in the front and back and write that one down so that you remember. And listen, he said, is there anything too hard for me? No. So that means if you got a headache, is that too hard for God? When's the last time you believed God for your headache, though? When's the last time you, you, you had a, something going on and you thought, well, I better go take a couple of Tylenol. I think I got a, I'm, I'm coming down with a headache. Come on now, be honest. You don't have to raise your hand. I know how we live. I know how we are. Well, you know what our mindset is telling us? That's too easy for God. That's too easy for God. God's not interested in a headache. You know, if I got something big going on, sure, God, he's going to get right, I'm going to get God involved in that. Amen. It ain't any harder for God to heal cancer than it is for God to heal a headache, I promise you. There ain't anything too hard for God. I don't care what our problem might be. It's not too hard. If God loves you enough to send his son to die for you, do you not think he's concerned about your head? And when you've got a headache? I guarantee you that he is. How many of you parents love it when your children feel great and they're jumping up and down and you wish they'd shut up for a while? But then one of them comes in, lays down on the couch, and you can tell by the way that they look that they're sick. And you say, what's wrong, honey? And your heart melts inside of you because you know that something's not right with your little one that you love. Let me tell you, God looks at us when we got a problem, and he looks at us like we look at our little ones. And he knows when we have a problem, and he is just as concerned about that little problem. And I'm going to tell you something. God may be more concerned about the little problem that you have than the big ones. And I'll tell you why. Because when you get a big problem and you know God, you'll come look him up. And when you got little problems, you act like you can handle it on your own. You take it on yourself. Just a, a very short time ago, we had a, a, a dear friend at the time, his little girl, got up on a, a weekday morning went in and sat down on the living room and told her mother she had a terrible headache. Terrible headache. They wound up taking her to the hospital. She died. Listen, God's concerned about everything that touches our life. And we have no clue what the devil's doing when he comes against us. And it doesn't matter how small it is, if we don't let God handle it, you know what? It's the small foxes, Solomon said, that spoil the vine. And something that may start it out very little. A few years ago, they had a great fire out in California, and it burned thousands of acres of trees. And they searched and they searched and they found the source, the original fire. And it was from a cigarette before they made them where they would go out. Ain't that what James said? The smallest, smallest thing can kindle. The greatest fire. It's the small things. God's interested in everything that touches our life. Come into agreement with the word. Amen. That nothing is too easy and nothing's too hard for God. That's what the word says. That's what I'm going to, that's what I'm going to believe. And I tell you the last obstacle today I'm going to, I'm going to hit on. You know what people do all the time? And I just shake my head and I think they just don't understand. We live in a world that blames God for everything. They blame God. They blame God because their parents were no good. They blame God because they were mistreated at school. They blame God because they had a flat tire on the way to work. They blame God. Uh, let me tell you, people blame God all the time. 
If God loved us, he wouldn't cause us sickness. If God loved us, he wouldn't have let Adam been in a car wreck. If God loved us, this wouldn't have happened. God, they always want to blame God. Don't ever be found guilty blaming God. You hear me? It's not God's fault. It's somebody's fault. It may not even be your fault. It may have been your parents, a grandparent. It may have been the devil operating through somebody else. But let me tell you, God is busy working on your behalf all the time trying to direct you to keep you out of trouble, to steer you around all these obstacles that are in this world that keep us from serving him the way that he wants. And so don't blame God. If you don't like where you're at right now, it's not God's fault you're there. You made wrong choices somewhere. Things happened that you thought were out of your control, but you know what? There are a lot of things that we allow, and the most unpopular message is still that one. Listen, God allows things to come. God allows obstacles. O obstacles are meant, there's three things that obstacles are meant to do. One of them is it's meant for our learning. I'm telling you the best way to learn, all right, is to face something. Learn how to handle it. Watch God work in it. See that, hey, God can do this. When I discovered that I had cancer this summer, you know where my mind went right back to? It went back three years ago when God delivered me off a deathbed and cured me from cancer the first time. That's where I went back. I knew God. I knew I could trust God. I never blamed God then. I don't blame God now. No matter what happens today, we're not going to blame God. Listen, if you're lost today and you don't get saved, it's not God's fault. If we're sick today and we needed somebody to lay hands on us and pray for us and you don't allow it to happen, that's not God's fault. If we go through life the, the rest of our days and we suffer things that we shouldn't suffer, you can't blame God for that. God's telling you, I'm your answer. God's telling me, I can fix your problem. God tells us he's a worker of miracles. He's a healer of bodies, no matter what it is. He touches hearts. He restores lives. I love some of the testimonies that come out of the fold. This week, a, a former fold member sold my brother a truck. Hey, man, he's, Crossville's doing great. I love to watch his on Facebook and see the success story of those who have come through, who made right decisions, who quit blaming God, who began to trust God, gave their hearts to God, let God work on their behalf. God has moved mightily in many of their lives, and I'm telling you, they're living a successful life today because of it. Lots of them. Do they all do it? No. Somehow the world has incorporated this easy street ideology into the church where we just take the easy street. Is it easy to believe God for salvation? Yes, it is. I'm telling you, that one is easy. Is it easy to believe God for healing? Nope, it's not. I'm telling you, if you want to be healed, you're going to have to line up, do some things, and trust God. You want your finances fixed? You want to get out of debt? You want restoration with family members? Let me tell you, it ain't always easy. There's a lot of people in this room today will tell you that, hey, we've been through some tough times. It wasn't easy. You know what we had to do? We had to keep the faith. You hear that? Keep the faith. Quit blaming God. Say, God, I know you're not responsible. God, I know it wasn't what your will was. God, help us to stand corrected. Help us, God, to press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God it's in Christ Jesus. Moving forward, trusting Him. I think often about Joseph. Listen, if you know the story in Genesis about Joseph, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's 11th son, Joseph, he was hated by his brothers. They, uh, his dad made him a fancy coat. Some of you know the story. Some of you probably don't. His brothers hated him. He went out to see what they were doing, take him some food, uh, listen, they hated him so bad, they stripped his coat off. They sold him into slavery. He's a teenage boy. God's got his hand on him. God's got his hand on Joseph. Who would have thought God had his hand on Joseph when they throwed him in a pit and sold him into slavery? Who would have thought when he went down into Egypt and he became a servant to Potiphar that God's hand was on Joseph? When Potiphar's wife accused him of rape and had him cast into prison, who would have thought that God had his hand on Joseph? When Joseph lay in there for days and months and then years, and it's like, who would have thought that God had his hand on Joseph? 
And then one day Joseph interpreted some dreams and wound up in Pharaoh's house. All of a sudden people began to think, hey, maybe God had his hand on Joseph. I want you to know there's some Josephs in this room, male and female. And you have been through some stuff, but God's got his hand on you. And God's been working you toward a specific end, and it's in your future. And don't give up and don't think that God doesn't have his hand on you because God does. I don't care what your situation looks like. It's never been worse than what Joseph's was. Your situation. And if you don't think God can take the worst situation and make some of the best out of it, then you just don't know God yet. And if you don't think God doesn't have his hand on you, you just don't know God yet. And if you don't think God doesn't have something tremendous in store for you in your future, you just don't know God yet. Which means it's time for you to make right choices. It's time for you to begin to trust God. You know what? You know what I'm going to tell you? When facing obstacles and you're going to face them, be bold. Look at them with boldness. Be confident and think, you know what? This is not too hard for me. Because it's not too hard for God. God, you and I, we make a pair and we can do this. Be bold. Be confident. Sound foolish if necessary. Listen, speak to those things. Pray out loud. Confess it. Listen, I'm not giving in. I'm not quitting. No, I'm not going to turn around. Devil, you can't have me now. You can't have me tomorrow. You can't have me ever. I'm going to live, not die, and declare the works of the Lord. Learn what God's Word says. Apply it to your life, even if it sounds foolish to the world. Because not everybody's going to believe you. You know what else you got to do? Stay active. You just cannot sit back and do nothing. We have to be doers of the Word, not hearers only. We've got to talk with God. We've got to pick up our Bible on occasion. We need to learn a few scriptures. We need to hide some of them in our heart. We need to apply them to things that's going on in our life. And you know what else sometimes you need to do? You just need to get loud. You just need to get loud. Because I've already learned when people get excited, when they get angry, when they get frustrated, you know what happens? They get loud. Did you ever get in an argument with somebody and you whispered? Oh, I'm so mad at you. I can't stand. No, you'd do it behind her back. Yeah. Did you ever try to get a stray dog away from you? Did you just passively say, now go on, little puppy. Go on now, puppy. Get out of here. Papa Dale don't want nothing to do with you. No, you get loud. In fact, you get hoarse. <laughs> Did you ever go to a ball game where Debbie was at? <laughs> she can go to a ball game on Friday. She's still hoarse on Sunday. She gets loud. You're trying to get your kid to do something to you just quietly, you know? Say, I, I wish you would go take the trash out. You might do that twice. Third time, you're going to get loud. I told you to take trash out. I like the children of Israel marching around Jericho. Six days in a row, they marched around and never said one word. You know what they were doing? They were psyching themselves up. They was casting down imaginations and they was putting some, you know what I believe they was doing? They, they were imagining that wall falling because that's what God said he was going to do. They were imagining taking that city because that's what God said he was going to do. They imagined that if they didn't do what God said, they'd be dead. So they, they watched their thoughts. They never said a word. But let me tell you, on that seventh day, the seventh time around, what did they do? They got loud. They got loud. They shouted. And what happened? The wall didn't fall until the shout came. Let me tell you, if you got to shout at the devil and get him out of your way, shout at him. If you think you got to shout and get God's attention, go ahead. Maybe that will prove that you're sincere about what you're asking God to do. Listen, get loud for your own benefit because you need to hear yourself believe in God, trust in God, speaking to your mountain, looking at your obstacle, overcoming it by faith. All right, listen up, children. As you approach each day your battles, don't let your hearts faint. Fear not, do not tremble, neither be afraid. For the Lord our God is he that goes with us to fight for us against all of our enemies. 
to keep us safe. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face to shine upon you and is gracious to you. The Lord lifts up his countenance upon you and gives you his peace. Amen.